waiting uh, for this service. One of the ladies in the church looked at me and said, you be sure and tell jokes today. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll see what I can do on that. Uh, there, 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 there was a pastor and two deacons that went into a bar. Just kidding. I'm not going to go there. Uh, uh, that, that wouldn't happen. I wouldn't go to a bar. I can't speak for the deacons, but... Uh, 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 today uh, we're we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna talk about rejoicing, not not that kind of rejoicing, but we're gonna talk about uh, rejoicing in the Lord today. Uh, and uh, I know that many of you this week may have had a great, fantastic week, and I hope that that is the case with you. I hope you've had a wonderful week. But some of you have probably had a tough week, and I hope that no matter whether you had a great week or a tough week, I hope that you are able to rejoice in the Lord today. The Bible tells us to rejoice when we're feeling like it, right? The Bible tells us to rejoice always. And the title of my message today is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. You don't have to turn there. It's projected behind me. Uh, I'm also showing off some new software that I have because it's, it has some cool uh, designs on verses here. Uh, but the, uh, the, the title of the message is right here in this verse. And the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, Rejoice always. I'll give you a week to memorize this verse. It's a, good, it's a good verse to memorize. If you need a week to memorize it, let me just say you're out of practice when it comes to memorization. Uh, this is one of those that ought to be pretty easy to remember, and it's also one that we should not forget. We are called to rejoice always. Let's pray as we begin this message today. Father, I ask that you give me the words to share this morning. I ask, Father, that you will show us from your word how it is that we can delight in you and rejoice in you even when life is tough, even when things are bad and difficult. And we certainly live in a world today where things can be bad and difficult. We think of the unrest right now in Baltimore. We think of the devastation, Lord, right now in Nepal. We think of all the many uh, people suffering, even in our church, you know, people that are going through health crises and people that are dealing with relationship troubles. And certainly we live in a fallen world and we are surrounded by difficulty. But that was the case back when Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. This world has always been a fallen world ever since sin came into the picture. And so, Father, even though there is difficulty all around us, even though we are, as Paul says in another passage, troubled on every side, Father, we can still rejoice in you. I pray that you'll give me the words to share this morning. I commit this message to your honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are called to rejoice in the Lord always. We are called to always rejoice. It would help, to, of course, to know our terms. What does it mean to rejoice? People think, uh, uh, have different understandings and different meanings when it comes to that word. But basically, to rejoice means to be excited, to delight in something. And, and how many of you have heard this, seen the t-shirt or the bumper sticker, Lord, help me be the kind of person my dog thinks I am? All right. <laughs> The reason why that's a very popular bumper sticker is because it's very true, all right? Now, I have mentioned to you on a handful of occasions that my dog is particularly annoying. And, uh, and my dog's name is Rex, and uh, he, is, uh, he's, he has his very annoying moments. But one thing about Rex is he is always excited. Uh, Rex either sleeps or he's excited. And he, he, uh, he loves company. Uh, if there was ever an intruder, Rex would lick them. You know, he would just play with them. But Rex loves company. He loves uh, uh, just the, the interaction with human beings and other dogs and stuff. And he loves barking at bicyclists and all kinds of things. Uh, and basically, any activity in front of our house, uh, the entire neighborhood hears about it uh, from, from our dog. Well, Rex, uh, whenever uh, we come home, uh, after we've been out for like from church today, we'll come home this afternoon and Rex will be excited. He will delight in our presence. He will be excited. And I want you to think about, about that for a moment. How many times are you excited to be in the presence of God like that? And that is what to, to really rejoice means, to get excited about it, to be passionate about something. One of the things that pastors will often do, one of the challenges pastors have, keep the new Christians away from the old Christians, all right? And, uh, and by old, I'm not, talk, I'm not talking about age. I'm just talking about people that have been saved a long time, okay? And the reason why is because sometimes over the course of, of time, people become more, uh, shall I say, uh, uh, worn out, beaten down. They become less enthusiastic about the Lord. But someone that's just recently saved, they understand what God has done for them. And they're excited. The God of this universe 
has actually, actually loves me and wants to have a relationship with me. The God of this universe sent his son to die on the cross for my sins. The God of this universe wants to be a part of my everyday life. And a new Christian is excited about that. And they're happy about that. But so often, many of us that have been saved for 20, 30, 40 years, it's like, yeah, what else you got for me? You know, we're, we're just kind of, you know, just kind of casual. We just take it for granted. You think about a, a couple that's just fallen in love. You know, and they're starting to date, and they're, maybe they just got engaged, and there's excitement, and there's passion, and they, can't, they, they, they love being around each other. They'll spend hours together, and they love it. And then you look at a couple that's been married, in some cases, not all, <laughs> but a couple that's been married for 20, 30, 40 years. And it's like they're sitting on opposite ends of the house, you know, and it's like they never talk to each other, and when they do, it's like, yeah, what do you want, you know? <laughs> And, you know, the idea is it's like there's no excitement. The spark has gone out, you know. And uh, now it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. Now, married couples, I got a tip for you. And this is not original with me, but I read this. Uh, actually, I didn't read the book. I just read the cover page. But anyway, the, uh, <laughs> and I read the introduction. You know, that counts. But this is written by a, a marriage counselor, and the book, his name is called The Ten Second Kiss. And the idea is, the challenge that she put out in the book is basically husbands and wives uh, kiss your spouse for 10 seconds every day. A straight lip lock kiss for 10 seconds. <laughs> Set a timer if you need to. <laughs> and do not break the kiss until 10 seconds are up. If you choose to continue the kiss after 10 seconds, that's up to you. But don't <laughs> break the kiss until 10 seconds are up. And she, she, she tested this with many couples that she was counseling, and she found that the couples who did that, the, marriage, the, mar the quality of their marriage went sky high when they did that. The reason why is because the way God has wired us and the way God has, has built us is if in the, Pro book, the book of Proverbs tells us this, if we commit our, our actions to the Lord, our thoughts will be established. Basically, your feelings will follow your choices and your actions. And so if you do the right thing and make a habit and build the right habits into your life sooner or later, you will actually enjoy it. Your feelings will follow that. But what many of us do is we just follow our feelings. You know, we just, if I don't feel like kissing my spouse, I'm not going to kiss my spouse, you know. And we have that kind of mentality. And after a while, we get in the habit of following our feelings and living by our feelings. But, but my main thing, that's the marriage tip for you guys, those of you that are married. But my main focus today is what about our relationship with the Lord? You know, many of us, we lose that excitement and that spark, and it's very difficult for us to rejoice. And then we read verses like this, and part of us, sometimes deep down, we're like, well, that's easy to say. That's easy to say, rejoice in the Lord. But you don't know what I'm dealing with right now. You know, I'm dealing with creditors, I'm dealing with eviction notices, I'm dealing with money problems, I'm dealing with a health issue, I'm dealing with all this stuff, I've got problems at work, and you talk about rejoicing the Lord, I can't rejoice in the Lord, my life is too difficult. You know, one of the best scenes that I, that I can think of in Scripture, and I've talked to you about it before, but it's found in the book of Acts, and it's when Paul and Silas are in a dungeon, and they're singing praises to God even though everything had been taken away from them, including their freedom, and they didn't know whether they would even have their lives when all was said and done at this, but yet they were able to sing praises to God. They could rejoice in the Lord even when their circumstances were bad. And it's easy to rejoice when, when things are good. So how do we do this? You know, and, and thankfully, uh, the, the Bible gives us an action plan, how we can do this. And, and that action plan is found in Romans 12 and, and verse 12 and it's going to be projected behind me, and this is going to be the outline today. Um, and it tells us exactly how we can rejoice always. This is how we can do it. Uh, it's interesting that, that this action plan follow, is in Romans 12. The beginning of Romans 12 starts out, you know, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable purpose. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you can hold on to what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is the beginning of this chapter. Later, Paul develops that, and he says this, rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. And we're going to break these, each one of these down today, this morning. We look at the first one, rejoice in hope. 
You have to have something to rejoice in. You have to have something to delight in. If someone just walks up to you and says, hey, be happy, you know, be enthusiastic. You know, it's like, it's very difficult to do that. When I was in the army and I was in basic training, occasionally the drill sergeants would come and they would say, this time is forced fun. I love that, forced fun. How in the world do you do that, you know? Uh, and, and it's like, you will like this because we are telling you to like it. And it was sort of like you had to simply rejoice in the fact that your drill sergeants told you to, they didn't say we used the word rejoice, they used other colorful language. But basically, you know, you want to enjoy this because we're telling you to. Well, it's very difficult to just enjoy something. You have to enjoy something for a specific reason. You've got to rejoice in something. You've got to delight in something. And... By the way, another side note on, on marriages here for a second. If you're always focused on your spouse's faults and flaws, you're going to have a hard time delighting in your marriage. And guess what? Your spouse has flaws. Not that I need to tell you that. It, now, those of you that are, that are just starting to date, the person you're dating, they have flaws, okay? I need to tell you that because, we, you know, when people are going through that dating stage, that infatuation stage, they're getting ready to get married, maybe that, all, that whole stage, their judgment is clouded, all right? And they think their spouse, their, their you know, significant other can do no wrong. After about 10 years of marriage, they recognize, yeah, my spouse has a lot of flaws. But the fear is the bottom line is those flaws were already there. They were already there. Every human being in this room is imperfect. Everyone has flaws. And you can choose to focus on the flaws of, the, of your spouse, or you can choose to focus on their good points. And if you focus on what you can delight in, you'll have a greater time in that marriage. Likewise, the Lord tells us not to rejoice. This is important, and I get this if you get nothing else. We are not told to rejoice in our circumstances. We are not told to rejoice in ourselves. One of, the, one of the, the lies of the world today, and you see this with different things, and uh, you know, yoga, frankly, and even some martial arts, and I'm not necessarily bashing everything about those things, but if you take them to their nth degree, there's a lot of pantheism and, and uh, individualism in that, and it's like look into yourself, that kind of thing. We are not told to draw peace and joy from within ourselves in the Bible. We are not told to, to um, you know, find, find a balance in the universe kind of thing. We're not to rejoice in our circumstances. None of that. We are to rejoice in hope in hope. And that means to rejoice in the object of our hope, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to rejoice in the gospel. We're to rejoice in God. We're to rejoice in our salvation. There are numerous verses that talk about this in the Psalms, even as David or Asaph or others who are writing the Psalms will talk about how they've got their, they're plagued with tribulations. They'll talk about rejoicing or delighting in the God of my salvation. And that's important. Because understand something, if you're here today, no matter what you're going through, let me tell you something that you can count on and know. You can know God is real. You can know that God loves you. And we're not just talking about an abstract God here. We're talking about the creator of this entire universe, <laughs> the creator of space, time, matter, and energy. The guy that's, that's, that's talked about in scripture that worked all these miracles, that's dealt with all these people in the Bible, the God that millions of people pray to today, that God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. Now, if that doesn't excite you, you need to check your pulse. That's the big deal, okay? And that God loves you. That God sent his son to die for you. And even though you are a sinner, and even though you are flawed, he still loves you and wants to spend all eternity with you. That's the thing that we should be delighting in, that he has made a way of salvation for us. And that's in spite of the fact that we're sinners, we don't need to look forward to a sinner's hell. We can look forward to heaven for all eternity. We can rejoice in that hope. We can rejoice in our identity as followers of God. We can rejoice in the fact that we are Christians. That is always something to rejoice in. It's a never-ending reservoir, a never-ending supply of joy and excitement for us. But rejoicing means that we don't just rejoice, when, as I said before, when things are bad. Uh, one of, my, one of the, my favorite verses is found in the book of Habakkuk, and it's not a verse that we often turn to. We don't normally go to Habakkuk, and so maybe some of you might have a hard time finding it in the scriptures, so I'll project it, behind, project it behind me. But Habakkuk, uh, I love this verse. It says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, 
the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. In other words, no matter what's going wrong, even if all my plans are, are, are going awry, even if everything I'm, I'm trying to accomplish is, is, is falling apart, I'm going to rejoice in God, in the Lord. I'm going to tell you a quick Jennifer story. I'm telling this without her permission, and she's here, which makes it all the more fun. But this was, uh, this was a, a Jennifer story from kindergarten. She probably doesn't even remember this, but this was uh, shortly after the fact that we, uh, I say we, Jane had just given birth to Jonathan. <laughs> I was there, but Jane gave birth to Jonathan. And as, as many of you, their parents know, whenever you have a new child, a new baby, that, that they take a little bit of time. You'll know that, right? Parents, you know, p- babies take some time. And uh, sometimes if you've got an older child, they can be a little bit, you know, jealous because it's like the new baby's getting all the attention, you know, and, and you're exhausted. And, you know, sleep, you don't get a lot of that when you're, when you're a new parent. And so we went through this period with Jonathan where, you know, he required all the attention and everything and, and getting you know, on a schedule and stuff. And so Jennifer was feeling a little bit, a little bit neglected. And so one day I took her out. Uh, we, she got off kindergarten. I got off work, and I took her, just me and her, out to Silver Diner. And you all like Silver Diner, eating at Silver Diner before? And I took her to Silver Diner, and, and she got pancakes. Jennifer loves pancakes, loved them then, loves them now. And uh, the pancakes and everything, and she was so excited, her eyes lit up. And as, we, as she was ordering, and as we were getting all the food, she looked at me and said, best day ever. Now, yes, she was excited about the pancakes, but... It was the relationship, the connection that really brought her the most joy. And that's the thing thing with us. If you have that connection and that relationship with God Almighty, then no matter what's going on in your life, you can say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Every time you get up in the morning, you can say, I got a relationship with the God of this universe. I've got a connection with God. I can rejoice in this no matter what's going on in my life. Do you understand the freedom and the power that that gives you in your life? To understand that the devil can throw anything at you and it's not going to take away your joy. It's not going to take away your God. You know, you look across the world today and you can see people suffering, including people who are Christians suffering. You look at, at, at what ISIS is doing overseas and I hope you've marked May 17th on your calendar Sunday night because that's going to be a great talk from our, from our dear friend Eric here who gives that talk. But there's troubling stuff taking place in the world today. There are Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, that are being killed because they're Christians. But you know what I find extraordinarily, uh, just, just, just extraordinarily awesome, it's a redundancy, but I can't think of the right words to describe it, about those stories is these are and often men and women who after several opportunities have refused to renounce their Christian faith and have willingly gone to their death as martyrs. And they did that because, you know what? Their attitude is, you can take away my freedom, you could take away my health, you could take away my life, but you will never take away my God. And they were able to have that connection, that relationship, and draw their purpose, identity, and even their joy in that relationship even when their circumstances were dire. And here in America, I think one of the reasons why we have so many unhappy Christians is because we're not really, when you get right down to it, we're not really taking our joy from the Lord. We're focused on our, on our circumstances. We're focused on our possessions. We're focused on money and other things. And if, and if those things are going right, then we feel like we're being blessed, and then we're happy. But when those things don't go right we start to get upset. And that question I want to ask you right now is, are you rejoicing in the Lord? And is your rejoicing and your joy strong enough that you're happy no matter what happens in your circumstances? That's the question I want you to be asking yourselves. And that kind of leads to the next point. But Paul tells us to be patient in tribulation. And in order to be patient in tribulation, we have to have the right perspective as we go through tribulation. We've got to have the right perspective as we go through tribulation. And that perspective is we are a soldier. We're a soldier in spiritual warfare. In 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, 
Paul writes, <clears throat> share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Now, I remember um, when I went through basic training many years ago, and I remember going through all, the, all this stuff that they put you through in basic training. And while I was going through basic, way back in the early 90s, and I, was, I had joined the Virginia National Guard, and I was going through the, what they call uh, Fort Benning School for Boys, otherwise known as, uh, uh, the, I don't forget what it was called officially, that's what I called it, but I called it other things too at the time. But, uh, but basically, Fort Benning, Georgia, went through basic training, and, and as I was going through that, they, were, they would show what was happening overseas, because I went through basic at the same time Desert Storm was happening. And so it kind of gave you a perspective on what this training was all about. I mean, this, this, they, they were training us with the possibility that we might have to board a plane and head over there, depending on how things turned out. Uh, and, and there was an understanding that this training is serious and that we shouldn't be entangling ourselves, you know, and getting too comfortable because, you know, we might be called upon to serve, maybe even make sacrifices. Now, those of you who are part of military families, who have had loved ones deployed, you understand what I'm talking about. You understand what the sacrifice that's involved in deployment. But for, let's take most Americans today, I don't believe that overall, now again, many families, many families understand very well what sacrifice is all about. And they've been through it. But I find that, that ever since really, you know, the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years, it's almost like Presidents and our leaders try to minimize the amount of sacrifice that the American people are going to have to go through whenever we get into foreign conflicts. But I go back to my grandfather's generation who served in World War II, and the entire country was rallied about around that. The entire country was called upon to give sacrifices. Whether you were overseas fighting or whether you were here, all of America was expected to sacrifice, whether it be in gas rationing or whatever. Because the idea was this is a war and we are in it to win it and we are not going to accept defeat and we're going to do whatever it takes. We're going to win this fight. And the entire country was behind it. And guess what? We won decisively. You know, not, and, and that, when you look back at World War II, it's incredible. Germany had better technology. Germany and Japan was spreading across the Pacific. It was, we were fighting two major empires on two fronts. But because of the resolve of the American people and the grace of Almighty God, we won. We won that war decisively. Now, the reason that we won is because we were committed and we were willing to make sacrifice. I think of my grandfather who served in Europe during World War II. My grandfather, uh, uh, Sergeant Gibson, was a sergeant in, in the Army, and he, one of the battles that he was in, the biggest battle, the biggest campaign he was in was the Battle of the Bulge. And the Battle of the Bulge, for those of you that are not World War II fans, the Battle of the Bulge was basically Hitler's last attempt to win the war. The Germans were losing. They were losing all kinds of ground on both fronts, one on the Russians and one the other front to the Allies, to the Americans and the, and the British. And, the, uh, and, and they, were, they were falling back. But Hitler and his, and his generals, they gathered together an army in reserve, and then at the right time, they launched an attack. The uh, Allies were completely unprepared for the attack. They were expecting the war to be over by Christmas. They were, they were thinking it was, on, it was, it was a mop-up operation at this point. And all of a sudden, here, come the German, here comes the German army. My grandfather remembers vividly, he's passed away now, but he remembered, when he was alive, remembered vividly what happened that day as the German tanks were rolling through the snow and coming on, on, up on his forces. He remembers his, his guys and, and guys from other units just running in confusion, just panicked, just scared, because they didn't expect this kind of resistance. And in the midst of all these guys running, running for their lives, one, my grandfather noticed the guy had a bazooka, and the guy dropped the bazooka and started to run away. And my granddad said, what are you doing? There was a tank literally coming down on them. And my grandfather said, you need to take that tank out. And the guy, in, in a rather profane way, said, no way, I'm out of here. And my grandfather said, well, show me how to operate this. And so the guy gave my granddad about a five-second lesson on how to shoot a bazooka. And so my grandfather picked up the bazooka and took out the German tank by himself. And for that, he got a silver star. Now, my grandfather understood that his comfort and his safety was not the highest priority at that time. He was a soldier. And he was committed to doing his duty 
even if it meant sacrifice. I really believe the longer I live, and I point, I point the fingers at myself too on this. This is not me preaching to you. This is me saying this to all of us. The longer I live, the longer I'm a Christian, the longer I'm a pastor, I don't think most of us really appreciate what it means to be willing to sacrifice. Most of us don't have the perspective of a soldier in battle. Most of us want to live a comfortable, prosperous life. We want to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. We want everything to be good. We want everything to be great. We want to just be comfortable. We want to, we want to basically just be happy, make money, and then eventually, if we have to, we can die. But we want to die with a smile on our face. We want to die surrounded by our family. We want to, we want to die, you know, with everything hunky-dory, basically. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to go through any pain. Now, I'm not saying we need to be masochistic. I understand we should do what we can, certainly to take care of our loved ones. I'm not saying it's wrong to make money. It isn't. We should strive to provide for ourselves and our loved ones. We should strive to make the best life we can here. Absolutely, all that's true. But you know what? If God calls us to make a sacrifice, we need to be willing to make a sacrifice. And there may come a point where God says, take all your comfort and put it aside. And I can tell you right now, many friends that I know, Christians, who had great jobs, great benefits, great situations. And God said, you're done. I want you to be a missionary to this country over here. And they left everything behind and they went overseas and they served as a missionary. Major cut in pay. God may ask that of you. God may ask you to make a sacrifice. He may ask you to do some things that economically don't make sense. God may put you in a situation where you're going through a valley and he's asking you to glorify him. He's asking you to sing praises in the dungeon because when you do that, you're a witness and a testimony to people around you. God's priorities and God's perspective is very different than ours. Very different than our perspective. There was a, a, a um, missionary family a few years ago where, and I forget which spouse it was, I, I believe it was the... Uh, the wife that passed away, I'm pretty sure, so I'll tell it that way. But basically, this young family, missionary family overseas, serving God. I mean, we're talking a devout family. And the wife got sick. And then Pete, the, the prayers went out across the, uh, the um, church network and stuff that was supporting them. Prayers all over the place. Pray, you know, heal this woman, heal this woman. God did not heal her. And she ended up dying. But as a result of that... That husband's parents, who did not know the Lord, those parents came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior because they were so deeply moved and touched by the love and the outpouring of support that was coming in from people that barely knew their son and barely knew their daughter-in-law. But because they were moved by Christ, all this support was coming from everywhere, and this, this, this family was overwhelmed by it. They gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. That's a victory for the kingdom of God. Now, from God's perspective, he looks down at that, and that, that woman who was a saint comes home and, and lives with him now in heaven, and then he's got two more people he adds to the kingdom of God, plus he fires up the base and gets the churches praying, which they should be doing all along anyway, for this missionary family, and thereby also now praying for other missionary families. And so this crisis that everyone is like, oh my goodness, how could God do that? This crisis has fired up the kingdom of God and added more people to it. So from God's perspective, it's a victory. And if, and, and if we had that perspective, when we go through suffering, it would change our lives. It would change our attitudes. There was a, a, one of my dear friends, I've shared this before, a dear friend, he lost his father about three or four years ago. And this guy is truly one of my closest friends. He's like a blood brother to me. And, uh, but he was distraught, obviously, when his father was going through that. And his dad was a Navy SEAL up until, up until a retired Navy SEAL, <clears throat> up until his dad was about 60 years old. His dad could pump out about 200 push-ups at a time without resting. I could maybe do 200 in a month. But he, his dad, <laughs> could do 200 at one time. Knock him out just like that. And it was awesome. But anyway, uh, the, his dad was a, just a big, strong dude. I mean, just a great guy. But anyway, he and his wife went down to vacation. He had a heart attack on the golf course. Went to the hospital. Then had another heart attack while he was in the hospital. They had to amputate part of his leg. He went into coma. 
this ordeal dragged out for about two or three weeks. But in the course of that, as, as the whole family was coming in, the nurses who were on the ICU unit watched this, and they saw the family coming in. They saw the praying. They saw the peace and the comfort this family had. Grief, yes, but peace, knowing where this father was going to go. And, and, and toward the last days, uh, the entire family, after they tried everything to, to save his life and nothing was working, after much prayer, the whole family gathered around his bed, and they said their goodbyes to him. Now, he was comatose and could not respond, but many medical professionals will tell you that the hearing is still working. And, and a comatose patient may not be able to respond, but they can still hear you, oftentimes. And so the entire family circled around, and they were talking to him, and they were assuring him. And in fact, the, the children said, Dad, we will take care of Mom. We will take care of Mom. You can go home and be with Jesus now. And as soon as they said that, after all had said goodbye, his heart stopped, and he died. The scene was so moving, and the faith of that family was so moving that some of the nurses said they were going to take another look at Christianity as a result of it. I wish I could say they got saved. I don't know if they did or not, but they, they said they were so touched by it that they had never seen something like that before. Understand that when we go through suffering, it's an opportunity it's an opportunity for us to glorify God, the God of our salvation. Suffering is not fun. Believe me, I wish I could avoid it. I don't like to suffer. I hate it. But that's what makes it such a powerful opportunity to glorify God. If you can be suffering and going through difficulty and yet still keep a smile on your face, keep your chin up, keep your chest out, and say, hey, I may be going through a difficult time, but I'm a child of the king, and I'm here to serve him. And whatever he wants of me, whatever he expects of me, I'm going to serve him and I'm going to stay true to him because it's all about him. And if you can say that, it'll give you joy. It'll give you victory. You won't be locked in. You won't be a prisoner of your circumstances and you'll be able to make a great impact for the kingdom of God. Do you have that perspective? And then Paul tells us that we need to be in prayer. We need to always be praying. And I think of the verse Colossians 4 and verse 2. Colossians 4 and verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Doesn't say pray occasionally. Doesn't say pray when you feel like it. Doesn't say pray every now and then. It's continue steadfastly in prayer. I think it's in 1 Thessalonians 2. Paul says pray. It is 1 Thessalonians. Paul says pray without ceasing. We are not to stop praying. You know how many times I've talked to Christians and I've been guilty of this myself, so I'm not putting anyone down. But I, talk, I talk to Christians, and, I, and they'll say, I prayed about this, but I didn't get any response back. I prayed about it, but nothing ever happened. And my answer is always the same. Why did you stop praying? Who told you to stop? You understand, we are to continue praying. Pray, pray, pray. It may be months or years before you get a clear answer, but you're not to give up. You're to continue praying. You should be praying without ceasing until you are called home. And prayer is not, and, and I, I've said this many times, but hear me on this. Prayer is not simply about sending requests up the food chain. It's not simply, you know, just punching in your order, you know, as if God is some cosmic bending machine. Prayer is communication with God. It's connection with God. And where, where, by praying and spending time with the Lord, you are present with the Lord. And you feel his presence in you. And here's the hard thing. Have you ever prayed without speaking? Think about that for a second. How was the last time you prayed without saying a word? You can do that. Because part of prayer is supposed to be listening and prayer is also just supposed to be just enjoying the fellowship with God. Have you ever enjoyed just being with your spouse? Just being with them. Just being present with them. No, no one has to say anything, but you're just there. That's the way it ought to be with the Lord, where you're just happy to be in his presence. And you draw strength and hope and courage from that, just being in his presence. I believe that's why those martyrs, are able to give their lives for the Lord right now overseas 
when the radical Islamic terrorist will say, you can renounce Christ and live, those people are in the presence of the Lord. And they don't fear death because they know that death is a reward. Death is swallowed up in victory, folks. Understand that there is not, if you can get this, if we can get this, there is nothing that we should be afraid of. Because if prayer is connecting with God from, from our fallen world that we live in, we're reaching up and connecting with the supernatural. When we die, guess what? We transition from this life and we go and we live in the supernatural forevermore. So death is something in a way to look forward to. Now, I'm not saying you've got to take the next bus, but I'm saying that when your time comes, and by the way, you know, I've heard Christians say, go the other extreme, and they, they, they're tired of living, they're tired of suffering, and they just want to end it. No, absolutely not. You never, ever, ever, ever think of ending your own life, ever. That's not an option. Bible says thou shalt not kill. That includes killing yourself. Never go there. When it's your time, you won't have to do anything. When it's your time, God will take care of that. And God will bring you home. And God knows when he's finished. He knows when you have finished your race. And so at that point, you, uh, you willingly walk into his presence without fear. But while you're here, no matter, as Brian was saying, no matter whether you're 6 or 60 or 600, that'd be interesting, but whether you're, you're whatever age you are, you need to be working for him, living for him, and continuing steadfastly in prayer. I know many of you right now may be feeling worn and weary and beat down because of the different things that you're going through, but God does not want us to stumble along in fear and confusion and discouragement. God wants us to focus on him and draw our joy from him. I can't promise you that all of your circumstances will get magically better if you turn toward the Lord. In fact, I can promise you that even if your circumstances right now get better, down the road you'll face more difficulty. The reality is we live in a fallen world, and if you're looking at Christianity as an escape clause from suffering, you're, you're looking in the wrong place. And that's my biggest problem with the prosperity gospel out there and some speakers that are out there pushing this is that if you follow the simple formula your life's going to be great nothing bad's going to happen to you that is a lie because listen, jesus christ is the greatest example that we could possibly have of holiness and perfection and he, it wasn't like he uh lived on mansions and and flew 65 million dollar jets and had had a great uh life you know jesus had to suffer and he went to the cross. But thanks be to God, he came out of that grave. And because he conquered death, we need not fear death, and we need not fear anything the devil has thrown against us. I just want you to grasp that today. The enemy will try to destroy you. The enemy will try to destroy your family. The enemy will try to tear you apart. And life will be hard, and life will be tough. But I want to close with the verse that I find in Isaiah. It's one of my favorite verses in Scripture. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's pray as the praise band comes forward. Father, I thank you so much for the fact that you're there for us. I thank you that no matter what we are going through, that we can have a relationship with you, that we can have a connection with you, and this relationship isn't just an abstract thing. It's not just an intellectual relationship. And we just recently had our apologetics conference, and the intellectual stuff is great. Studying the evidence is great. But it's not just an intellectual faith, Father, that we have. It's a relationship, Lord. And Father, my prayer for everyone here, for myself too, is that we will feel your presence in our life, that we will feel you working through us, that we will connect with you, that we will draw our joy from your presence, that we will draw our joy from your strength, and that when even our flesh may fail, that our hearts will be strengthened by you. So Father, I pray that for everyone here. If there's anyone here that's going through a particularly difficult time, 
and they need some prayer, this invitation is for them. If there's anyone here that doesn't know what their relationship is with you, they don't even know where they might go when they die. They, they don't know anything about what it means to be saved or any of that. Lord, this invitation is also for them, that they will come forward and pray with us, and Lord, get that right. Father, I pray that, uh, that you will just be with this time, this brief time, invitation and reflection. May it all be to your honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll please stand.